Hello. Thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School lesson study. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come today to thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you, Father, that you have watched over us throughout last night, that you have kept us safe and that you've gotten us up this morning and that you've given us a heart and a mind to assemble here together to praise and to glorify you as we study your holy word. We thank you, Father, for this church, the Greater Shallow Missionary Baptist Church. We thank you, Father, for each and every member. We thank you for those that are in positions of leadership and stewardship. We pray, Father, for your guidance and for your direction through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is that we may gain wisdom and knowledge and understanding to apply these truths into our daily lives. We pray, for, we pray, Father, for those that are sick, those that are afflicted, those that are suffering from the loss of some loved ones, those that are confused and downtrodden and dealing with the many issues that they see in and around their world on a daily basis. The extreme concern that we may have, Father, concerning the senseless killings that we see through the use of guns and other weapons, Father. Help us to understand, Father, that you did not create us to kill one another, but you created us to love one another as you demonstrated when you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross. We pray, Father, for this neighborhood. We pray for this community, for the county, for the city, for the state and for the nation, as well as for this world, Father. We pray, Father, that one day we would come to know, Father, of your love and that we would demonstrate this love through our love for one another. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension back into heaven, the coming of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Again, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study as we continue in our summer 2024 quarterly study, which has been entitled Hope in the Lord. And so we've been studying for the month of July from Unit 2, which has been titled Expressing Hope. And so that brings us to our last lesson for the month of July, which is the July 28, 2024, Lesson 9, which is entitled Expectant Watchfulness, as we will read from Psalms number 130 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so as we look on our screen, we see our lesson outlines for Lesson 9, which is entitled Expectant Watchfulness, is divided into two teaching outlines. A first outline has to do with address to the Lord. As we read Psalms number 130, verses 1 through 6, our second outline has to do with address to Israel. As we read Psalms number 130, verses 7 through 8, and so let's look on our screen and we'll see our lesson scripture for today, which is entitled Expectant Watchfulness, as we read from Psalms number 130, which is a song of ascent. And so let's begin reading at verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. 
He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so next we look on our screen at our lesson context, which is divided into two parts. As we have read from Psalms number 130, and we read the entire Psalms number 130, which is verses 1 through 8. Our first part of our lesson context, which is entitled Expected Watchfulness, has to do with our introduction, as well as the concept of out of the depths. And so let's begin our reading, our lesson context, beginning at part A, uh, introduction, out of the depths, which should be on our screen. Psalms number 130 of the New International Version of the Bible covers a lot of ground. Psalms number 130, New International Version of the Bible, begins by acknowledging the terrifying possibilities of human life and ends with hope for a different future. Yet, in reading it, we should not skip too quickly to the end. In Psalms number 130 of the New International Version of the Bible, the focus is precisely on human sin. The terror that the psalmist faces comes from the human tendency to allow vices to overcome us. That tendency threatens to take over everything we do and are, throttling our best plans and spoiling our best intentions. What can be done about this problem of sin? As Dietrich Bonhoeffer noted in The Cost of Discipleships, and I quote, together they, the disciples, the church, brings their guilt before God and pray together for grace. May God forgive not only my sins or forgive not only me my sins, but us our sins. That sense that both our sins and the possibility of forgiveness unite us in a central of the song, unite us, and this is the central of the song, and to the book uh, as a whole, or to the Bible as a whole. And so next we look at our lesson context part B. And so let's begin reading our lesson context part B. Psalms 130 of the NIV is part of a larger cluster usually called the Psalm of Ascent, or less often, the Pilgrimage Psalter in Psalms number 120 through Psalms number 134. The Psalms in the group may have originated at different times and places as would be true of modern hymnals, but functionally together as songs for the pilgrims entering the Jerusalem temple in the period following the Babylonian exile. Psalms number 120 through number 134 falls into three subgroups. Our first subgroup is Psalms number 120 through 124. Our second is Psalms number 125 through 129. And our third is Psalms number 130 through 134, which is where our Psalms number 130 falls today. Perhaps the pilgrim sang them at different stops on the road from the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley and into the precinct around the temple itself. Psalms number 130 NIV in particular may have served as part of a night vigil as the pilgrims awaited the dawning of God's light in their lives. In Psalms number 130 verse 6, those hypotheses are reasonable, but they are hard to prove. Yet they would explain the varying moods of these psalms and their progressive closeness to the temple itself. Most certain is that the Psalms together address a wide range of concerns and moods. 
Together, these psalms allow the worshiping community to express anxiety and hope, fear and trust, sorrow and joy. That is, they help worshipers bring their entire lives to God, share their lives with each other, and eagerly await God's transforming work. And so we look at our, continue to look at our lesson context, which has to do with, uh, as we have been looking at and reading, expectant watchfulness. And so let's read part C of our lesson context. Psalms number 130 of the NIV moves the pilgrim from an attitude of despair, for he says in Psalms number 130, verse 1, and I quote, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, the, to one of supreme confidence in God's saving work in Psalms number 130, verses 7 and 8, and I quote, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. When the one singing focuses on their personal suffering, fear and sorrow overtake faith. But when the focus shifts toward God's inclination to save and the consequent hope that the entire community may enjoy. The mood may change to hope. So it is here in Psalms number 130. In Psalms number 130 of the NIV, though very short, it's only eight verses, moves in several steps from a statement of need addressed to God to acknowledging or acknowledgement of God's mercy and confession of hope to an address to all of Israel. And so Psalms 130 of the NIV begins with a cry to God, as most laments do. But here the attitude is one of deep need and expectations of help. It differs from some Psalms uh, either of lament by being briefer and jumping to praise without much preparation. In these songs, Born of Distress, the singer either promises to praise God or does so. The promise or the praise is born out of gratitude for God's generous response to the petition for help. In Psalms number 130 of the NIV, seems like a very condensed lament that shades into something different altogether. Perhaps that difference from other Psalms reflect this one placement in a larger group. Psalms 130 of the NIV does not have to do all the work a normal lament does because it does not stand alone. Psalms 129, which is in the group before Psalms 130, describes long-standing attacks on faithful Israelites and expect God's deliverance. While Psalms number 130 of the NIV expresses contrition before God, collectively these Psalms together positions the one playing as someone in the correct spiritual position before God. And so that brings us to our lessons outline for today, which is on our screen. And our first outline has to do with address to the Lord. As we read Psalms number 130, verses 1 through 6, our first subtopic has to do with God listen in verses 1 and 2, which should be on our screen. And so let's read Psalms number 130, verses 1 and 2 of the subtopic, God Listen, as we begin reading at verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. And so we see in verse 1 that this phrase, or the phrase, out of the depths, might be a shorter form of the phrase, the depths of waters. 
as we see in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 27, verse 34, and in Psalms number 69, verse 2 and verse 4. Isaiah, in, in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 10, states, and I quote, Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over. And so the Hebrew word that's translated here, depths, only occurs in these instances in the Bible. And that is images of a watery depth, a watery deep, were frequently used as an image of danger or chaos, especially the horror of drowning, as we see in Exodus chapter 15, verse 5, and in Psalms number 69, verse 2. The concept of depth is linked to Sheol, which is the place of the dead. And so depth and Sheol should not be conflated, but neither should the possible, possible link between them be neglected. The psalmist here speaks metaphorically of having descended to the realm of death, as, as in to Sheol. Though not equivalent to hell, Sheol was under the earth and generally considered far from God's presence, as we see in Numbers chapter 16, verses 30 through 33, and Psalms number 6, verse 5. And we can also contrast those two with Psalms number 139, verse 8. No one worshiped God in Sheol, as stated in Psalms number 88, verses 10 through 12. And so the phrase here, I cry to you, Lord, points to the many sorts of problems humans may face, including our own mortality and our own proneness to sickness, as well as the hostile attitudes of wicked people or the irresistible power of some historical or natural events. And so this depth that the Psalms talks about may take many, many forms. The Psalmist now addresses God in hopes of being heard and saved, as we see in Psalms number 49, verse 15, and I quote, But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead, he will surely take me to himself. And so this cry to the Lord is asking God or asking God to listen and come early in many of David's Psalms as we look at Psalms number four, verse five of David, Psalms number 55, verses one and two of David, Psalms number 61, verse one, Psalms number 86, verse one, Psalms number 141, verse 1. And so Psalms number 130, though it's not attributed to David, nor is this request to hear repeated word for word, but each instance is share the idea that God will be inclined, one, to listen, that the human being ought to seek God's attention, and that each supplicant or each one praying may do so freely, in the company of others, as we see in Psalms number 130, verses 7 and 8. And so the psalmist is not in danger of dry, drying or drowning or may not literally be about to die, as we see in Psalms 130, verse 3. But in many different forms, the suffering can feel like a death, such as a physical ailment, to relational estrangement and beyond. But in all of these circumstances, even as far as God, as, even as far from God as the Israelites could imagine themselves, at the bottom of a deep body of water, all of those and all of us, when we get into that state, we can cry to the Lord, as we see uh, in today's study. Now, in verse 2, with the phrase, Lord, help me or hear my voice, the psalmist continues his petition to God. The verb hear, hear, and the direct object, my voice, reinforces the importance the psalmist places on receiving God's full attention. 
The phrase, let your ears be attended to my cry for mercy, asks for tangible but unspecified expressions of God's favor with the phrase, my cry for mercy. He's crying for God's mercy in his life. And so God's care begins with not only listening attentively to the contents of this psalmist's prayer when he says cry, but also acting to alleviate those specific concerns which are unspecified in today's study. The psalmist does not yet state his specific occasion for writing this psalm. A feature of the psalms that invite us as also petitioners to God to consider our own pleas or our own supplications or prayers to God. And so similar languages like this appear several times in Psalms of Lament, as we see in Psalms number 86, verse 6, Psalms number 140, verse 6, and Psalms number 143, verse 1. Also, Psalms number 28, verse 6, offers a counterpart to the request for God to hear, for God to hear, by celebrating that God has already heard as we see in Psalms number 31, verse 22, Psalms number 116, verse 1, and etc. in the book of Psalms. But all of these Psalms expect that God desires to listen to sincere requests for help and will respond with speed and compassion. We do well to remember, however, that God's timing is not our timing, as Peter points out in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And a perceived lack of an answer from God does not mean that God has not heard us or has no intention of acting on our behalf. As we see in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, and in John's gospel, chapter 11, verse 21 and 22, concerning the death of Lazarus. And so our next second uh, subtopic for our first outline is subtopic B, which has to do with God forgives, as we read verses 3 and 4, which are on our screen. And so let's read verse 3 and 4 from Psalms number 130. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. And so in Psalms number 130, verse 3, we see that the psalmist affirms God's mercy here with this question. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, who could stand? If God decided to tally our sins, no person could be counted as righteous as we see in Psalms number 14, verses 2 and 3. Also in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 20. And Paul writes in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, where he concludes that there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the God of Israel engages with human beings to reform their lives rather than count or tally up their sins to use against them. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 and 20 states, and I quote, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people, and I will be their God. And so the psalmist here believes that God delights in forgiveness and the repair of human life that makes it possible, as we see in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, as well as, and I quote from Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? 
And so also we see that in Peter's Pentecostal sermon here in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 39. And so the psalmist here, by appealing to God's mercy, which is the person praying, also commits that he will reform or try to reform his life through his trust and his faith in God's promises, as we see in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Now in verse 4 of today's study of Psalms number 130, the psalmist's knowledge of God's desire to forgive as well as mercy becomes clear. For in Psalms number 130, verse 4, the psalmist suggests that God's mercy towards sinners inspired him to honor God more. Instead of being mired in sins and paralyzed to choose or to do better, forgiveness creates a new path for the petitioner or for the prayer or for the one offering up supplication to God, as we see in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 16. And so God's divine gentleness with people inspires all, in part because it seems so different from human inclination toward one another. In contrast to the pitiless ways in which we often respond to mistreatment or wrongdoing, God exercises his mercy toward us. And so the phrase serve you is absent in the older translation, but it still has the idea that with reverence, which is fear of the Lord, it leads to service to God in a pro is appropriate here. And so as we see that in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13, also we see Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 15, that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so we look next at our subtopic C, as the psalmist declared that he's waiting for God in verses 5 and 6 of today's study. And so let's read uh, Psalms number 130. Verse 5 and 6, which are on our screen. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. As, and in his word, I put my hopes. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. And so in verse 5a here, in saying that I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. The psalmist claims to anticipate God's saving work with every fiber of his body, both body and soul. And that is with every fiber of his being, meaning, meaning both body and soul. The psalmist's faith involves an orientation to a future in which the problems of the moment find a solution in waiting for the Lord. Now, in verse 5b, to hope is a synonym for waiting on God. So in Psalms number 130, verse 5a, we never hope in vain when we place our hope in God's promises. God's word referred to his promises of salvation first given to Abraham as we go back to the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 where God promised to make Abraham out of a great, into a great nation, which becomes the focus of this faithful person's prayer life or this faithful person's life, the psalmist's life, life. Having confidence in God's promise shapes behavior for a lifetime as well. As we saw in Abraham, Abraham looked and waited for God's promise over 25 years which was ultimately fulfilled in his son that was born to Abraham and Sarah, named Isaac. And so we see now in verse one, uh, Psalms number 130, verse 6, that it repeats this phrase, more than watchmen wait for God. And he does that for rhythmic, rhythmical purposes. We might also recognize this in some of our hymns or psalms, songs today. But this repetition also expresses the intensity of waiting for God's saving act. The waiting involves the person's entire being, both body and soul, as we saw in Psalms number 130, verse 5a. And so the emphasis could be on waiting at a specific, 
a specific time, or like during the night, or it could be emphasizing the watchmen who are watching. In either case, an analogy here is drawn. Just as nighttime watchmen eagerly awaits the dawn and the relative safety of daytime, so does the one praying wait for a new day in which God will act in their lives. And so this psalmist's faith requires hope in God's future action. As he continues to wait on the Lord, he has this expectant hope that God will act in his life based on God's promises. And so now we look at our second outline as we read verses 7 and 8 from Psalms number uh, 130, which is entitled Address to Israel. And our first subtopic has to do with hope in God. And so let's read verse 7, which should be on our screen. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. Now in verse 7a, uh, this, as in Psalms number 30, verse 5 and 6, the psalmist now shift focus from his own individual prayer, his own individual waiting on God, to the whole community of the faithful, which is the nation of Israel in this case. This sort of shift occurs in Psalms of Lament, as we see now in Psalms number 130, but it lacks uh, any transition. As the Psalms now turn from the psalmist uh, and his address to God to his address to Israel, the people of God. The phrase here, hope, especially in God's unfailing love, that the psalmist expressed for his personal circumstances is prescribed for Israel, which is the faithful community here. Now in verse 7b, the phrase redemption is the appropriate translation, uh, translation here of this Hebrew phrase. Redemption is a legal metaphor. In ancient Israel, a redemption often applied to the purchase of slaves so that they may be free. The language here is prevalent in texts describing God's liberation of the Israelites from the Egyptian bondage, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, chapter 9, verse 26, chapter 15, verse 15, also in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 23, and in the book of Michael, chapter 6, verse 4. So in Psalms number 130, verse 7, the psalmist now anticipate God's action or God's acting to free Israel from sin's power. This redemption is the ultimate fulfillment of God's ancient covenant to Abraham and his ancestors. As we see in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verses 4, 46 through 55, as Mary celebrates the birth of the Christ child, Jesus, in her song, in Mary's song, in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And so next we look at our final uh, verse for today, which has to do with subtopic B, and that is receive redemption. So let's read verse 8, which is on our screen, of Psalms number 130. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And so now we see that Psalms number 130, verse 8, ends with an expression here of deep trust in God, as in Psalms number 22, and hope in God's promises that he has made, as described not only in the uh, book of Genesis chapter 12, where God made a promise to Abraham, but that promise is fulfilled or was fulfilled in the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. This ending repositioned the whole psalm because it moves the readers from focusing on their individual situation to focusing now on God's promise to redeem Israel from all of their sin. In God's great mercy lies hope for Israel 
and not only Israel, for everyone else who believe in God through his son, Jesus Christ. Psalms number 130 probably lies behind the promise that the angel told, said to Joseph in Matthew Gospel chapter 1, verse 21, and I quote, she will bring forth, talking about Mary, to a son. She will give birth to a son, talking about Jesus, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And that's what the name Jesus means, meaning that he will save people from their sins. And so Jesus became the sign as well as the instrument of God's redemption, not only to Israel, but to the larger world also, and all that put their faith in God through their trust in God's son, Jesus, which is the Messiah. The people of Israel were the community whom God rescued from the evil and all of its manifestation, of which we are spiritual descendants. The people announced and celebrated the good news that such deliverance had occurred, as we see in uh, Exodus chapter 15, uh, concerning Moses, the song of Moses and Miriam as they crossed the Red Sea on dry land, and all of Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. And they sought more of it as they continued their journey from Egyptian slavery through the wilderness into the promised land. And of course, that understanding also now applies to the church which is the community that has been grafted into the family of, uh, of Abraham and into the nation of Israel. As Paul would write in, Paul, in Romans chapters 9 through 11. And so we also experience both as individuals and as a community of believers in Christ Jesus, the power of God's forgiveness which we imitate in our daily lives and in our dealings with others. And so we conclude our lesson today with this thought, the power of waiting. And so let's read our conclusion, which is on our screen. Psalms 130 speaks to faith that involves waiting for God's grace to make itself known. During such time, the person may doubt God's ability or willingness to save, questions the integrity of other human beings, and even lose self-respect. Waiting for salvation challenges every fabric of a, uh, every fiber of a person's being. Yet that challenge itself strengthens faith in the long run. As Psalms number 130 makes clear, trust in God does not come without some doubt. Will God listen? Biblical faith is not a Pollyanna attitude, and that is choosing to focus on the positive aspects rather than the negative aspects about life. It is realistic and honest about hardship, yet it does not remain there. The spiritual challenges we face, such as the depths that the psalmist cry out of, becomes opportunity for grace. Therefore, learning the dis discipline of waiting is part of learning to live with God and all others who are also awaiting God's help. Psalms 130, in short, exposes an important truth about human beings, and that truth is our profound need and desire for God's presence. As part of a community of pilgrims that is seeking or that are seeking God's presence. The faithful person can speak to God even in the most desperate, uh, desperate moments of life. The communal worship of the Israelite community acknowledge that fact or acknowledges that fact. God does not skimp on acts that will benefit human beings, but rather frequently engages in them. Worship in the community still reminds us of God's mighty act. May we, in our darkest moment and in the grasp of sin that don't want to let us go, cry out to our God and heed the call to hope in his saving works. Our thought to remember for today's study is this.
Faith celebrates our hope in God's forgiveness and calls others to do the same. The writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 of the New International Version of the Bible, and I quote, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us close today's study with prayer. Father, we thank you, Father, for today's study. And we thank you, Father, for the insightfulness of the psalmist as he said he will wait on God even as a watchman waiteth in the night. Help us, Father, no matter how deep our cries may come from the depths, no matter how terrible our situations may seem, or no matter how impossible we may think it is, help us to hold on to our faith in you and through your Son, Jesus Christ. For we believe, Father, truly that ultimately you want to forgive us, and Father, we want to repent of our sin and ask you for our forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, who fulfills all the promises that the psalmist writes for, write about, as well as the promises that's spoken in the Old Testament. For in Jesus now, Father, through our faith in him, we too can have that life and we can have it more abundantly. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Thank you for your participation in today's study. I pray God will continue to bless and keep you and your family safe. Have a great day.